we have Mr. Monty Metzger, who's a business angel, who will be talking about the digital future, trends and opportunities you need to know about. And joining him on stage as a moderator, we have Milica Begovic Radovic, who is, in no particular order, a mom of one of the cutest kids I know, who works at the UNDP office in Montenegro, and who's pretty much the person I want to be when I grow up. So please welcome them both, Monty and Milica. Hello, everybody. I don't think we could ask for a better speaker to get us started off after a really good lunch. He has a series of really cool words that follow him, like business angel, like um, Masha has just said. But if you look him up online, if you look at the presentations and talks that he has given, there is one characteristic that follows him along, and that's that he likes to talk about future, and he's really, really good at it. And that's specifically what he will talk to us about today, digital futures, trends, and opportunities that we need to know about. Monty, floor is yours. We are a very backward-looking society. We are backward-looking because it is just human nature. We all experienced the past ourselves. We look around and we see evidence of the past all around us. All information we are creating suddenly becomes history. The past is very knowledgeable and yet we are spending the rest of our life in the future. It almost seems like we are walking backwards into the future. My job as a business angel is to actually help to turn people around, is to help to create an understanding of what the future might hold. So today, I'd like to talk about the digital future, its trends, its opportunities, its drivers, and the things you need to know about. Who wants to know about the next big thing? Raise your hand. OK. But before I'll answer this question, I'd like to learn something from you. And I brought an innovator's test. There are four symbols, the circle, the Z, the triangle, and the square. And I'd like to take a couple of seconds that you focus on one of these symbols, which reflects your personality the best. Which symbol is the one your stomach is probably feeling that it, it's yours. It represents yourself. Just take a couple of seconds. Did everybody find one of the symbols? OK. So I'd like to ask you to stand up if um, you chose the square. Who got the square? One, two, three, okay, two more. The square stands for IQ. So I'll try to make it very simple right now for the next couple of minutes, as IQ in the room is not as high. Who took the triangle? Stand up, please stand up. Up, up, up and about, up and about. Stand up. So the triangle stands for creativity. So quite some creative people in mind. Chris here, uh, that's good. What about the set? Who had the set? Okay, well set. Okay, the Z stands for leadership. <laughs> and who had the, the circle? And who had the circle? Please stand up. Okay, just the rest. So the circle stands for sex and alcohol. <laughs> so <laughs> So I think your your social skills we, we, we're going to need them to later in the evening probably at the party. Monty, which one are you? Which one do you oh, choose? I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay, so Low IQ, good party crowd, so let's keep going. <laughs> I'd like to uh, mention some of the greatest moments in digital history. So I went through the timeline and I picked a couple of them, like April 3rd, 1973, when Martin Cooper, a Motorola engineer, did his first mobile phone call with some of the press people. 
But you have to imagine this one, the mobile phone was over a kilo, had probably 30 minutes of talking time and uh, had took 10 hours to recharge. 1975, a supercomputer cost $5 million and had the capacity of computer power as an iPhone 4. So that's one of the dramatic price points in Moore's law, which has changed a lot. And then in, on March 15, 1985, actually the first domain was registered. Who knows what the domain was? Predrag? <laughs> it was symbolics.com. July 16, 1995, Amazon went online. And on September 17, 1998, a guy from Amazee, from Bavaria, close to where I grew up, Andy Bechtolsheim, founder of Sun, wrote the first check of 100K to Google Inc. The problem was, Google Inc. was not registered yet. So Larry Page thought, well, if the check says Google Inc., we're going to become Google Inc. So that was the start of Google. January 15, 2001, Jimmy Wells started Wikipedia, and we know, all know what happened after that. On August 9, 2006, MySpace welcomed 100 million users. And now they're trying to like, rebuild it in a new form way. But during that time, Facebook was not even public yet. It was made public in September 26, um, so when it opened for everyone. But let's not focus on the past so much. Let's look into the future. So I try to shift perspectives and to look into the digital future. I brought a couple of trends. And I'd like to start with the digital Big Bang, something which starts now and will probably hit and change the internet forever next year. And the key question is, what will happen when the internet grows from 23 top-level domains to more than 1,500. This is the internet pre-Big Bang. So we had a couple of top-level domains, sides to the top-level domains from the countries, um, like .com, .co, .me, um, .net, .org, .edu. And next year, we're going to look at the new internet, which looks like that. 54% uh, of these new top-level domains are generic names, such as .shop, .education, um, .web. 39% um, going to be brands like .bmw, um, .mercedes, uh, I don't know, Toshiba, something like that. 4% will be community-driven names, and 3% geographic. So the next generation of internet has been created by the forum ICANN, you know, the guys who are in charge of all the domains on the web. So they have um, opened a registration window last year where you could um, pay a registration fee of a roughly 150 or 180,000 US dollars to register for your personal um, top-level domains. So I looked at that and thought, well, .monty would be pretty cool. And um, due to the high price, I thought, well, will it worth it? But um, I didn't apply. But almost 2,000 people or companies applied um, for top-level domains. Um, 1,500 had been unique strings, which are going to be launched very soon. And 50% um, of these had been actually top brands who are registered, and 36 of the Fortune 100 companies. But um, like everybody who missed it, actually, have to wait a little bit. So ICANN will probably open the registration window in the next two to five years. In internet times, that's like a decade already. So it's a huge opportunity. And you have to imagine that with all the registration three, ICANN earned over 350 million US dollars in fees. So a key question is actually, what will companies do 
who actively invested together over 350 million US dollars? Will they sit and wait? Or will they do something? Will they promote their domains? Or will they try to get a return of investment? Here are the top filers, companies who had applied for domains. So Google applied for 101, Amazon 76. There are a few others like Donuts, um, who actually is a consortium, a new company who just had been started due to filing new top level domains. And if you see the top filers, you can also have to question who filed and who did not. There's no Facebook, there's no Twitter, uh, there's no eBay. Did they sleep or did they think, well, that's not relevant for us, no, we are already quite big. Um, here are some of the domains, sub-level domains, which have been really um, the most attractive. So .app, for example, had been 13 um, companies who actually applied to get that. So there's some kind of way actually they figure out how, who actually will get it at the end. And um, before, what I also like to point out here is if you own such a top level domain, you can also certify that it's a, your official domain. So imagine if you're a banking house, for example, you can really guarantee that it's no phishing emails, it has a, s a certain specific um, security behind, and nobody else can actually register as long as you, as you want it to. Um, for .app, for example, they will do a own business model around and do differently. And this leads to a big change in search. Because if companies are pushing into that direction, um, we might find more different kind of um, top level domains in the search results than like a .com or um, other local co uh, country top level domains. Only Google invested around 20 million US dollars. And so you can just imagine or think about how will they change the algorithm? Will they push their own domains? Will they give it to others? Will it open up? Um, and this change actually creates a big opportunity. It creates an opportunity for the fast followers, the big companies, let's say like Yahoo, um, to turn around and to do something. And it's also a big opportunity to, for entrepreneurs for startups, for innovators who can actually see how change will, how search will change um, to, to become um, a, a, the new platform on a dot app top level domain or something like that. But two things are for sure. The importance of a good domain will never decline. And the importance of domain will grow. Even if we have a bigger variety, a digital big bang, it is still important to have a great name and, and, and a good domain. Let's jump to the next topic, connecting the unconnected. It's a big topic also discussed now at the UN week in New York right now. And I'd like to show you a couple of facts. There are five billion people without internet globally at the moment. And there are few digital companies and um, leaders who are actually trying to connect these unconnected people. One project had been launched by Mark Zuckerberg recently called internet.org. They um, teamed up with a couple of, of the major network providers and they're thinking about how to finance that and how to actually also create a kind of a fair business model or even free use for schools in local areas. On the other side, there's Project Loon from Google. That's more an innovative approach. They'd like to set up and raise balloons, um, huge balloons in the sky, which are very low cost, and they create kind of a ne mesh network uh, in the sky on 20,000 meters height and um, try to connect to rural areas on a global level. And these balloons are actually pretty smart. They can navigate on their own um, to find the best spot actually in height and like wind speed and everything to more or less stay on the same spot all the time. And they'd like to raise, I don't know, 100 of these balloons and create a mesh network and have some, some ground stations to, to get connected. And it's all above uh, our normal flight 
um, um, height. So that's, that's Project Loon. So here you can actually see one of the balloons at the, as, a, as a prototype. Another cool project is um, one, la one Laptop Per Child. It had been launched quite some time ago by Nicolas Nicoponte, but during the time it had evolved and it turned into um, a new tablet computer. I don't know if you Into a tablet computer with a solar powered back of the tablet. Very low cost, and the goal is actually to provide it to every child in the developing world, or at least to give access to these computers. And it's all going back to how to connect the unconnected. Imagine if they have the access to the resources we have, to the information, to the education, online education, but also to feed their families. One cool startup is actually called Sama Source. It's a foundation, and they're revolutionizing microworking. So they are actually putting the small tasks of big companies like HP, Microsoft, Google into and, and outsource it to developing countries. And they are working on these workstations um, to actually do the little things for low price, fair price. For, but for them, it's a huge opportunity to first of all have access, to learn how this works, and uh, to also earn some money. So here on the left, there's, on the right, there's uh, the founder. Leila Jana, uh, who founded this. Another big movement, and the third trend I brought to you, is the human user interface. It changed a lot already in the last couple of decades, since we are now in the touch era of the iPads and iPhones. But at the moment, I have a big feeling that there's um, a new change coming. There's a lot of investment going into new startups who are also thinking about beyond an interface like we have it today. One you know is definitely Google Glass. Another one which is going into the same direction is a Japan company called Telepathy. They're going even a little bit beyond Google Glass to where you have your mind which collects information and with your brain waves you can control a mouse or something like that. And um, it's also looking quite good, I think. Another one is Leap Motion. It's a little de um, device you put in front of your computer, and you can have gesture movements like on Matrix, and you can move things around. You can go from slide to slide just by swiping, stuff like that, without touching the, the monitor. And another cool um, company is providing an armrest, MYO armrest. And with that armrest, you can actually make gestures with your fingers. And you can tap with your fingers and then create actions. So it actually recognizes the impulses with your muscle in, in, in the arm. And um, so for example, you can um, have toys like a drone, which will be navigated by your arm just by pointing at it at different sections and go left and right. The next trend you have to look at and you have to keep in mind is the Internet of Things, the smart objects around us. It creates kind of a nervous system on a global level. And it, it's already quite huge, and it will become a tremendous uh, network of things. In, by 2020, there will be over 50 billion connected devices. And basically, everything can be connected, from cows transmitting their data roughly 200 uh, megabyte per year, uh, connected shoes, connected trees, connected lamps outside that can tell when they're broken and need to be exchanged, or even some mobile health uh, things like for asthma people. The commercial use which we'll see right now is things like the Fitbit. It is not like a mobile health application which is very um, needs to be, have some security, stuff like that. It's more like a wellness. It's like keeping you fit. A more medical thing is the Airstrip wireless monitor. They have like a, a digital plaster which you put on your chest, and then uh, you can actually monitor your own mental uh, uh, vital signals or transfer it to your doctor. Another one is a little add-on for your iPhone called Alive Core. So you can also measure some of your medical 
um, information. Or you can measure your blood pressure with this uh, blood measure um, application from a French company. And there's a startup who raised money on Kickstarter from Australia, which uh, had a kind of an interactive light bulb. So you just put it in your normal light bulbs, but you can control the, the, the color as well as turning it on and off from your, from your iPad. And this is something where the big guys actually slept. They didn't recognize that there is a market to get a connected light bulb, but they raised uh, over a million dollars uh, within two days, so certainly some people want to have it. That's how it looked like. And these Internet of Things actually create also something else, the body area network. This is your personal network, which um, covers and, and, and um, documents your vital signs of your body. Some of us uh, already have something like that, like you have the iPhone, you have your iPad, watch or something like that, which is connected already. But it will be more relevant. On top of that, we'll have um, digital um, and movable um, electronic print. So you can actually print on textile, you can print on paper, and this can create um, sensors for toys, for milk boxes, or f and the milk box can tell you when it's already outdated. Or you can just swallow a sensor to track how your medicine is going in your body. So context is king. And I've got some examples of how, what the power of context is. So here are some advertising. Don't take it too serious. Um, but it shows how powerful the context of these things are. So who wants to open the car, taxi? Want to have a drink? Or this delicious drink here in this newspaper? Somebody for ice cream? Or well, who got thirst? <laughs> so power of context, certainly something which is important. Another big movement, which also John mentioned, is the 3D printing, hardware on demand. The 3D printers are coming down in prices dramatically. So the maker movement, actually, they're creating these maker 3D printers going down to a couple of thousand dollars or even below to have your own 3D printer. So hardware is becoming kind of a, it, it's, it's, it's not the key anymore. You can produce in, in very low um, pricing and you just have to access a key data or a, speci a specific model or you can basically send over some things and then print it out. So there are a couple of 3D printed products, but this one is actually the one which um, got into news a lot. That's the Wiki gun. So it's a 3D printed gun. And it's low cost, around 20 bucks, and it has dramatic, like, very, very good shooting uh, um, sensorics, and it's almost like a real gun. And they're actually increasing this uh, a lot, the quality of these 3 printed uh, products. And besides guns, there's definitely you as a creative team here in the audience can think about a lot of other things. But now I'd like to jump into the social economy. What if the social media landscape we have turns into a known economy, a global economy? And the first example here I'd like to mention is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the first social and global currency. It's been um, talked a lot um, during the time. And um, I can still imagine or remember um, the time when Second Life was used a lot. On Second Life, you already had the Linden dollar, which had been transferred globally and was kind of a gray network. And Bitcoin actually turned that idea into a peer-to-peer -peer controlled environment. So it's very secure, it's very public, you can see all the transactions, and it's open source, so you can even download the code on, on GitHub. And even if it's still in the, in the first steps, it seems that there is kind of a turning point um, of, of thinking about how we um, convey money, how we use it, and how we also pay on the digital world. Another social economy uh, phenomenon is social reading. There's a platform called Rap Genius, and they started to explain rap lyrics. 
So you could click on different wordings and things, and it, they explained what it actually means. As you know, in all the hip hop and R&B songs, it's sometimes complicated, especially for non-native speakers, to understand it. But it turned out to be very useful for other things as well. So they uploaded the Bible, they uploaded speeches by Barack Obama to explain what he actually meant with that sentence. Another thing is social discovery. There's a cool uh, startup I work with in San Francisco called Trailer Prop. They're actually creating a way to find cool movie trailers and movies which you probably didn't heard about. The problem with movie industry is same like in US, uh, music industry, is there are roughly 100 new movies coming out each month. But you probably he just heard or, or read about one or two which do most marketing. But there might be 10 others which might be very interesting for you as well. So how to find the good things in the social media landscape? That's uh, all about social discovery. Social sharing. It's growing dramatically. That's the numbers from back in 2005 to 2015. And basically, um, it says the digital information created and shared in setabytes. So we, in 2015, we have eight setabytes of shared and published information, like you do on Twitter and Facebook. And just looking on photos, it's interesting that the green bar on top, that's not coming, I have to explain, the blue bar is probably f is from Facebook. Then there's a yellow or orange one which comes from Instagram, which grew um, because a lot of people used it. But then there's Snapchat, the green one. Snapchat is growing rem dramatically. And um, so just a couple of numbers on that. The number of photos shared per day um, on April 2013 was 140 million photos per day. Okay. Last but not least, there's instant service. Service with a, with a push of a button. In Germany, we have My Taxi. While in the US, you have Uber and other services, you can actually just push a button, you get a, you get a service. Imagine this service with a push of a button into all different kind of industries. E-commerce, for example. There's a, another startup I work with, Weiss Golf. They're actually producing um, golf balls on a premium level. And you can just click it and buy it instantly while you're playing golf with one button. Or smart add-ons. I know that we all love the touch device era, and you touch on your iPhone. But sometimes it's good to have a physical button. So there's a, a startup who launched on Kickstarter called Pressy. And it's this, this little button, actually, which you put in your um, speaker um, headset um, connection. And it has a little button on top. So you put it in your headset, and then you have a physical button. And you can program it with all different kind of um, digital tasks. So if you click once, it sends an email out. Or if you click two, it says, I'm not available, and sends automatically an SMS to the, the text message to the guy who called. Whatever you do, you'd like, turn on lights with your life X, light bulb, something like that. So they raised also a couple of $100,000 in the last couple of days, and it's a pretty cool product. So seven trends you need to watch. Digital Big Bang, raise of domains, connect the unconnected, human user interface, internet of things, hardware on demand, social economy, and instant service. But how practicable are these trends? How can you actually look and bring them into your daily life? What does it give you? To answer this question, I'd like to quote Steve Jobs. Right now is one of those moments that you are influencing the future. How is the future created? You have to think about how you can actually can take control over the future, how you can influence it. And to answer that, you have to think how people create the future, how you make decisions. And people make decisions today based on their interpretations of what the future holds. Or differently said, 
our visions of the future shape the actions today. So how can you influence the vision of the future to make the decisions you want to get, create? If we change people's visions of the future, we can change the way we make decisions. Here are a couple of things you can actually do to change the future and to make, to create such a vision. Like on this conference, we can create a spark. We can drive the vision. We can cause the world to take notice. You can call John Biggs as long as you can until he writes something about you. We can implant new visions into the minds of the decision makers. We can track the progress and we can act on the results. That's quite a bit of control actually we have on the future. But how much control do we really have? Come on, really. I would say less than we want, but more than we think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation. The discussion on Twitter had finally stopped in terms of the circle, sex, and alcohol. And then you brought up those slides with context is the king, and it all went downhill from there. So, but there was one question though. Uh, you mentioned Bitcoin, and there's a person in the audience with a Twitter candle um, boy who wants to know what do you suggest in terms of Bitcoin? Should we purchase Bitcoin now? From a trend scout perspective, I always say, eat your own dog food. You have to try it. Everybody who's just reading about it doesn't have a clue about what's really going on. So take 10 euros, 100 bucks or whatever, and just try it. Do some transactions. Try it, uh, what you can buy, how does it work. And after that, you actually, you really have a much better understanding. It's like um, reading about Twitter and then using it. It's a whole different experience. Okay. Um, you mentioned Connect the Unconnected. Earlier this morning, we heard lessons about how to make it in the valley. But what would you advise to people sitting here who would like to try out as entrepreneurs in some of those emerging economies? It's always good to have a global view on things. So you have to consider what your idea, what the potential of the idea or the business you're starting holds. It's either something which doesn't exist in your region, but it's a great opportunity um, which you can build up here. But some ideas are much broader, and then I realized that some of the entrepreneurs are actually not brave enough to bring it on an international level. Mainly, um, mostly every startup in the US or in San Francisco who starts doesn't want to stay in San Francisco. They want to conquer the world. And if I talk to a lot of Berlin startups, for example, they're pretty happy with the German market because it's huge, but the idea is much bigger. So they could actually just try to also um, go to San Francisco for a couple of months to, to make it in different languages. That's the first step, something like that. So it depends on the, on the thing you'd like to do, but uh, think globally. Yep. Okay. Um, any questions from the audience, audience for Monty? I've got like 33, so maybe I can jump in while they're thinking. Um, you are a founder of a cross-innovation academy that is a biannual, by-invitation um, event that sounds very cool from what I've read, but could you tell us a little bit more about what the academy is? And if somebody from this room would like to get invited to it, what would they have to do? Actually, we, we started the cross-innovation academy four years ago, and we did events at Google, uh, Dutch Telecom Hubraum, for example, we, um, when they got started, we did in Berlin, and uh, British Telecom and everything. And it turned out to be uh, a need for digital leaders actually to connect and to think about how the digital environment, internet, mobile, all tech will develop. So we have um, turned it around a little bit, and we have like renamed it or started something new, which is called Digital Leaders. So it's digitalleaders.co. And that's basically the Cross Innovation Academy. It's the same format, very interactive. You learn a lot in a compressed time frame. 
And we teamed up with the Bavarian government and, and doing a couple of events uh, globally. So we've done one in New York at the Harvard Club and we're going to San Francisco October 8. So that's the next event. And then we are going November 26, London, and then Tel Aviv, Moscow, to, to the main hotspots actually where innovation happens and try to connect the, the digital leaders who are shaping our future. All right, so we have to have some digital leaders who are shaping our future in the room to be invited to digital okay. leaders. Okay, all right. Um, you've had several talks in this region on this topic. You were in Zagreb earlier um, this year. Mm -hmm. So when you look at uh, Southeastern Europe or, or the Balkans, uh, where do you see some of the strengths in the uh, startup sector when it comes to some of the trends that you have mentioned? I think the, the potential in that region is enormous. I met a lot of um, founders and entrepreneurs who are actually very passionate about what they do and they love to innovate. And also, the alternatives in their country sometimes are not as good, so they could probably take on a normal job and earn a little bit of money. Um, but if they are becoming an entrepreneur, it's not only like having a good job, it's also setting a, a dream into reality or moving things, changing things, improving um, things in their own country, uh, but also just um, doing things more internationally. So the, the crowd here is very creative. Um, of course, the infrastructure is, is not as dense as in, as in other cities. But um, as I said, for some entrepreneurs in Berlin or in Germany um, are, for example, too relaxed, probably too laid back, and they're, they're not picking up in speed uh, as, as some of the people I met over here. Um, so I think the opportunity is great, and um, yeah, good, good startups here around. Um, you're very passionate about what you do, um, and it's, oh, we have one question that might yeah. be more interesting than mine. Yeah, please. Hey, Monty, I have a question for you. So in Bulgaria, where, where I'm living, yeah, entrepreneurship is fairly new and there's the ecosystem is just starting, but everybody wants to copy what's been out there already. So, you know, like when Groupon went big, we had Groupons all over the world, everybody wanting to sell to Groupon and copy it. And I keep trying to tell them it's not really a great idea, but they just want to do it anyway. Is this something, is there a message that you give? Like, is it a good thing because they can just practice and fail? Or is there a message you can give because, you know, you're thinking, okay, this is back, behind, like we need to look to the future guys, stop copying. Is there a message that you give to try to convince these guys that we could spread here and in Bulgaria and other places to try to be like a little bit more convincing than I've been able to be? I you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think certainly you can push it a little bit. But um, that's the dilemma actually of a normal innovation cycle. If you look at um, things which had been developed in Europe, it had been copied by in, in China very rapidly. So a microwave, uh, a fridge, they've done it cheaper, better, faster in China. And they copied it. And the same happening in the internet as well. If there's a new startup in, in featured on TechCrunch, there will be 10 people in China working on that to copy that. And what is happening now on, on a certain level, certainly to fridges and everything, they're, they're having an own R&D department. And also in China, where I lived for a couple of uh, months um, to build up a company, is actually they are innovating themselves. They are not only copying. They need some time to actually learn how things are working. And then they're thinking, well, we could actually do it a little bit better and, and, and transfer it. And then the next phase is to actually do things on their own and think, let's do something really Chinese or Bulgarian, and, and which nobody thought of. So it's, it's kind of an innovation um, cycle, life cycle, where the first phase is you, you blind, blindly copy it, and then you realize, well, it doesn't work in our country like that. Or um, the next phase is that you adapt it. And then there's r real cr uh, creativity and innovation happening after that. And you see it in all different kind of industries happening. So that's, you can push it to make it faster, but I think people have to make their own failures first or to just copy things which, which haven't been there. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep, yeah, one here. Okay. I, I really liked your presentation. It was so study. But 
with respect to the real forecasting problem, I, I like your beginning that we are, the human being is looking at the past and talking about the future. But this is again like, I use it second time today, it's like catch 22. Because yeah. the world is working on the majority of the stuff. Some will succeed, some not. There is a time frame. You didn't mention if we'll have, I mean, on the globe, we'll have it as product in two years, or five years, or 10 years, or 20 years. But my claim, and I wish you to comment, is that the real breakthroughs, you even don't know how to talk about. Imagine that some new breakthrough in science will cause some algorithm and some neurological stuff that you'll not even be in a situation that you will be needing domains. I, I, if you will ask me how, I don't know. But, but you are thinking about what is happening with the domains. And you are building the whole world about how to improve it. So you may speed it, but the, the real forecasting there are many professors that are making their life by forecasting. Some are saying something that is true, some, that's nice. But what is the real breakthrough? Yeah, so I totally agree. The real breakthroughs, actually the things which you can't see, the things which are coming from behind. Like if you're a music manager, back in the 90s, like your world was perfect, and then MP3 came along and it was, everything was ruined. And so that's basically um, your, your point that um, the big things, the disruptive innovations, that's normally the things which you can't predict as good as others. Um, looking on technology, actually it's more easy because you know which patterns had been filed, which topics they are working on, especially in Israel actually, they, they have tremendous innovation power and um, so you can actually predict that things are going to happen, but some people are just closing their eyes and see, well, ho hopefully it's not happening to me, <laughs> but it will. Thank you so much, Monty. Big round of applause for Monty Metzger, please.